Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This episode is sponsored by ATA. Visit atacpa.net to learn more about the services they offer for individuals and organizations. ATA, your long-term accounting partner. Today's guest is Lee Farabaugh, co-founder and president at Core 10. Welcome, Lee. Hey. So um, we want to find out all about you. Tell me a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up, and, and what your childhood was like. Okay. Well, I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which might be a bad thing for all the Tennessee fans <laughs> in our state. Um, my, my parents both went to the University of Alabama, and then later in life, my dad um, worked there. He, was, um, he ran public relations for the university, and so I was born when they lived there um, post-graduation. Um, and we lived in Alabama until I was three, and then um, we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, um, my dad was a TV anchorman, and that public relations gig at the university was kind of a, I don't know, a, a, he was taking a little career change to see if, if you know, that was a, something that he enjoyed, but ultimately, um, broadcast journalism is his true passion, and so we went back, I feel like back to Charlotte, of course, it was the first time I had been there, um, and I grew up there, I, I was there until I went to college, um, and also went to undergrad in North Carolina. Um, and so, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a home where uh, my parents both really encouraged me, um, both around creativity and technology. Um, my dad was fascinated with computers and he brought a computer home when I was about five years old. Um, it, you know, people talk about floppy disks. This was like real floppy disks. <laughs> they flopped. <laughs> And you booted the operating system in drive A and you put the programs in drive B and you could only do one program at a time. And, but we just thought this was the most amazing thing. And um, the, the greatest gift my dad gave me um, in bringing that computer home was he said to me, just play with it. You can't mess it up. And I don't know that that was actually true, <laughs> but it gave me the freedom to play with it and to explore. And um, we had some games uh, where you could, key in commands and um, it was called logo and you can make a little turtle move across the screen and do uh, designs on the screen. And so that was kind of my first um, foray into technology and computers as a, as a kid. And um, I was also, my whole family, you know, are, are sort of creative people. My dad's a journalist and my mom was a um, stay at home mom, but you know, a, a creative person in the sense that she could make anything you wanted clothing wise. Um, so I was also always encouraged in the arts, um, you know, lots of crayons and markers and watercolors and things around the house to, to play with and express myself with. So um, I think that's followed me through my life because my career has really pretty much been about the intersection of creativity and technology um, and then later on business. So. Um, that's a little bit about my growing up. Now, I, I noticed um, when I was doing a little research that you won a really cool contest when you were five. Um, and so I thought to myself, you know, her parents, you know, had to have been the ones who got that going. Is that, tell us a little bit about that. So you must have done some deep research. Is this the, is this the art, the art contest? No, the one where you pick the stocks. Okay, okay. Okay, so this is a fun story. So, so I mentioned to you that my dad was a TV anchorman at WBTV in Charlotte. And um, they got this idea to do uh, um, a, a show on, or series on the stock market. And they had a professional stock broker, a, a lovely gentleman named Bob Bambauer, um, pick five stocks. And they had me pick five stocks. And I was five years old. And I think I did something like pick my favorite letters in the alphabet. And then somebody, you know, drug their finger down the page and until I said stop and they picked a stock. Like it was so random. <laughs> and the idea was to track my stocks and his stocks for, I forget how long it was, two months, three months, something like that and see who did better. And part of it was I got to go to New York and go to the stock exchange and they, you know, they filmed all this it was super, super fun. And of course, you know what happened, right? The five-year-old stocks <laughs> beat the stock broker, <laughs> but he was very, um, very gracious about it and actually, you know, remained a friend of mine um, throughout my life. And he actually bought me 
uh, a few shares of the stock that I had picked that did the best, um, which is, you know, was a, a lovely gesture. So yeah, that was a really fun thing to get to do as a kid. That was my first trip on a plane was five years old in like 1982 or something crazy like that. And you got to actually go to the stock exchange, mm -hmm. right? And see, yeah. see how it was all happening then. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so at some point along the way, um, your parents were instilling in you this interest in uh, STEM, um, which mm -hmm. was really great. And now, you know, we often lament the fact that there aren't enough young ladies who are choosing some of the uh, STEM areas to go into. Uh, what do you think your parents, other things they did, because I know there are parents listening who would love to have, you know, their daughters embrace some of these, some of these uh, fields as well. So what other things did your parents do? Yeah, you know, I think one of the key things was they just exposed me to a lot of stuff and some of it stuck and some of it didn't. Um, and then when they figured out what I really cared about and what I was really passionate about, they just encouraged me to take those avenues. So, I mean, I remember one year at Christmas, I got a chemistry set, um, you know, where you could mix different chemicals and reactions. And I remember thinking that was really cool. And, you know, we played with it a lot, but ultimately science wasn't something I was either super passionate about or, or great at, you know, biology, chemistry, that kind of thing. I was really more interested in arts and um, even math, which is a little weird. Um, it doesn't seem to go with arts all that well. And so they kind of, you know, gave me lots of options and then saw what I gravitated towards and, and encouraged me in that. Um, and one of the things my mom said, and I think, I think this is possible even, you know, depending on your means, my mom always said, we, you need good equipment. So, um, you know, she would say, it's important that you have a, a, you know, a box of crayons, you know, or some good paper to draw on or, you know, things like that. You know, she just always said, if you're going to do something, have, have good equipment and it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but, but that way you can really explore something, you know, and, and give it a fair shake if you, if you've got the right stuff. That's really smart. And I think, I see that oftentimes my wife is an art teacher and so you know I, I see all these boxes coming in from these different uh, places where she buys all these art supplies and she says the same thing you know that somebody can get really frustrated and quit if they don't have the right tools to be right. able to do what they're trying to accomplish so that's right. really right. interesting did yeah. you have any uh, siblings I, I have an older sister yep who's who is an incredible artist um, in fact I often say that she is artistic and I am creative. She can make something out of nothing. I'm not great at that, but I can put stuff together. Um, but, but yes, I think watching her and seeing her um, incredible talent was always something that encouraged me to, to try. And she's a good bit older than me. So I was, you know, it was impossible for me to produce the same kind of things she was producing, which was frustrating as a kid, but it was also encouraging, like, you know, look at what I could do with some time and some practice. And so uh, your high school years, um, which, uh, which group were you in? Who, who were you in high school? <laughs> it's so funny because my high school girlfriends are some of my best friends to this day. And in fact, during this um, time of the pandemic, we've been doing a happy hour on um, Monday nights. And so we, we earned this nickname in high school. There were six of us and they called us the AG girls, which um, I think was a little bit to make fun of us because um, we were in the gifted classes and it was kind of like they were trying to say the nerdy girls without being mean. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I wasn't the homecoming queen, you know, I wasn't the cheerleader. Um, but I will say the AG girls did, did just fine for ourselves. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that group all day long. Um, but, but some wonderful friendships that have lasted years and years and, um, and really stood the test of time. We spent a weekend together back in September, and I don't think the laughter stopped for, you know, a good, you know, 72 hours. <laughs> so That's amazing. So, so you were going through um, high school, and then how did you, how did you decide uh, where to go to college? How much thought did you put into it? You know, a lot of folks listening are, you know, going to be, um, looking for colleges at some point. And in my own experience, I have two daughters. 
And mm -hmm. so one looking for college was a huge endeavor. We visited like 15 different schools and the other one just pretty quickly picked the one she wanted to go to. So how, what was your experience like? So that's an interesting question. Um, so I went, my parents were really um, adamant about me attending public school. Um, they were big believers in supporting the public school. So I went through public school um, from kindergarten to 12th grade. And I um, graduated from a big high school. And one of the things that I really wanted was a smaller school. And I had never gone, you know, I'd never had private education before. And so I wanted to um, go to a smaller private liberal arts school. Um, and I, like I mentioned before, I grew up in North Carolina and just like Tennessee, you know, there's tons of great schools there. And um, my mom kind of advised me, you know, she said, there's so many good options right here in the state. And if you get homesick or you just want to, you know, home cooked meal or come do your laundry, you could drive home if you stay in state. And um, that was really good advice. I think, you know, as a high school senior, you know, you think you're so worldly, but looking back on it, I was relatively emotionally immature. And being able to, to drive home and see my parents was a really great safety net. And I think my mom saw that and she was trying to say it in a nice way, like, you might need us. <laughs> so um, I chose Wake Forest in, um, in North Carolina. So it was 90 minutes from home, which was just far enough away. They couldn't drop in, but uh, I could make it home on a quarter tank of gas because I, I did it numerous times <laughs> so that my dad would fill my car up. Um, and so that was a really wonderful experience. Um, and, and I was, my undergraduate degree was in fine arts. Um, and, and that was wonderful. You know, I, in some ways where I am today, I wish that I had done something that was a little bit more practical, like gotten a business degree. You know, Wake Forest has a wonderful business school. But I've told that to several people and they say, eh, <laughs> you know, don't sweat it. You know, you, you study what you really love and care about and are passionate about in, in your college years and you can make whatever you want to out of your, out of your career. And I, I think that's, that's largely true. I mean, I've been able to learn the things I needed to know about business in, in the School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the, it's, it is interesting what I tried to tell my kids is the vast majority of people that I know, that I work with, that are my peers, are doing completely different things than what they actually majored in um, mm -hmm. in many cases. So um, I'm the same way, you know, doing very different things than what I thought I would do when I first started off. What did you, what did you, um, the freshman in college version of you, what did you, how did you see yourself in the future? Well, I thought I wanted to be a graphic designer. And um, so the year that I went into undergrad was 1995. And um, there was an opportunity at Wake Forest to be part of a pilot program. They were planning, so I was, I was the graduating class of 1999. And they were planning for the graduating class of 2000, the class after me, to all enter school and be given a laptop. And so my year, they were doing a pilot program where you could, you know, essentially try this out. You get a, an IBM ThinkPad laptop and there were um, computer components of different classes that you took. And um, we could all be in the same dorm, all the, all the kids in the pilot program. And to be totally honest with you, it was a co-ed dorm and that was probably 50% of my decision. <laughs> but I decided I wanted to be part of this pilot program with the laptops and, um, you know, get to experience. Um, technology in my day-to-day -day life. And, and I remember in high school, my, my high school boyfriend showing me how you could buy an airplane ticket on the internet. And I was like, oh my God, like mind blown. You know, this is amazing. Um, this was back in the day of AOL and, you know. Um, so <clears throat> I was um, very incredibly fascinated by the internet. And of course it was just, fledgling at that time. I mean, you couldn't do, web pages were just text on, I mean, linking to a database was kind of like wildly, bizarrely, you know, futuristic at that point. So, you know, I saw myself as a graphic artist, graphic designer, using the computer to, you know, build, probably at the time I was thinking print publications, because, you know, most of what you could do online was not that interesting, but that's, that was the freshman version of me. That's, that's what I thought. I was gonna yeah, that's um, when um, 
same time period, um, I was actually managing graphic designers um, in a company that made gift wrap, gift bows, and and accessories. And I remember when we had we had invested in this little tiny Mac, um, and we had gotten a little disc out of a uh, magazine, yeah. and we all plugged it in together, about 20 of us, around this little, and it makes that little noise, ing, 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 <laughs> you, know, you have mail. And we yeah. were all gasping, and you know, of course, we were all trying to figure out what are the what are the applications for us, graphic designers, you know, of this new thing that's been invented. So yeah, and it's interesting you say that because by the time I graduated college, I the year before my senior year, I think it was, I had an internship with an an ad agency in Charlotte, and um, I was thinking that that would parlay into a job but they weren't really all that interested in the internet. Um, in fact, one of the partners said to me, oh, this is a fad. And so I just remember thinking, okay, that's, I'm not gonna work there. Um, and I ended up going to Chicago and working for a um, marketing firm, marketing and advertising firm there, where they had a, a gentleman whose sole purpose in the company was to take them into the internet era. So you know, by that point, I realized you know, print media is gonna, it's just not that interesting to me. Online media was what was so interesting at that point to me. Well, I, after that, I ended up working at an ad agency um, where the principal, um, Merritt Mosby, was an incredible, talented uh, designer from, from, you know, way back who had been working in Memphis for decades. Super talented guy, but I'll never forget, um, he had a, a dog food client. Um, and he did all the bags for the dog food company, and he did them by stippling dots in the four colors. So he was, wow. you know, <laughs> so it was just mind blowing to be seeing that level, you know, of handwork without a computer at the same time trying to move into the the digital age, you know, in advertising. And you know, I I was from the era where in college where if we wanted to make an ad you know, we would have to buy those rub on letters. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and I had a huge collection. I, it broke my heart when I finally threw them away, but you know, you would have to rub on the letters. And I think back how, um, how, what is level of skill some people had to be able to actually do that. So mine looked like a ransom note usually, but. I was gonna yeah. say, you had to get it all lined up. And did you have an X-Acto knife? Oh my gosh, yeah, I've cut amber lists. <laughs> thousands of hours cutting amber lith. And yeah. I asked my girls about that the other day. They don't even know what amber lith is. Right. You know? I have scars on the sides of my fingers from that exacto knife, you know, getting a little too close. <laughs> I remember there was an ad agency I wanted to work at really badly. And my portfolio was horrible. And so I, um, I, um, uh, cut a bunch of amber lith as an example of the work I could do and said, look at all this amber lith I can cut. Um, I had a, I had a job interview at this advertising agency and um, the uh, person who interviewed me took my portfolio and then he took out that, you know, the design manual that we used to always get every year, the annual. So he took that out and he goes, these are award winning ads. And then he put his hand on my portfolio and said, these are not. Oh. So that was when I decided to go into marketing. Soul-crushing. <laughs> yeah. But it was actually good, you know, because I was just average, you know, and so. I mean, here's the thing I think about that, though. I mean, I think that design is like a muscle and you have to train it and you have to practice with it. And, you know, you can be, you got to have some innate talent for it. I get it. But um with good instruction, good mentors, and over and over and over practice, I think you can turn, you know, not uh, award-winning <laughs> ads into right. award-winning ads. Um, so I hate that he did that to you. That's <laughs> well, and and I totally agree. Um, and the other thing is, there are different roles in design and creativity, and in that in that business, there are all different types of positions and jobs and. You know, so um, I want to uh, not run out of time before we talk a little bit about design thinking, because I'm so sure. fascinated by that. Yeah. Um, a lot of folks listening may not know about what design thinking is. Can you uh, kind of give us a little overview? Yeah, so I'll give you Lee's definition of that. Um, to me, design thinking is design that is rooted in reality or in, in data about real people. 
And I like to describe it as kind of a circular um, process that happens over and over again. And it starts with research and understanding who it is you're designing something for, what do they need, um, what are they like, what are they capable of, putting together some prototypes, rough designs, um, taking them back to those original people and saying, here, play with this and see what they do. And based on what you learn in your evaluation of how they handle your prototypes, either throw it away and go back to the drawing board or continue to refine and show it to them again. Um, it's been amazing to me in my career how many times I thought I nailed it and then I showed it to a real user and they stumbled or they were like, what is this? Or this doesn't make any sense. Or they couldn't figure out which button to press. Um, it's just very humbling. But essentially um, design thinking is, um, is creating something where your end user is very integral in your creation process. Um, you're not just making something that's beautiful. Um, you're making something that's functional. Did, um, did your knowledge of and awareness of and training in design thinking um, have any impact on as you were starting to figure out um, what kind of business you wanted to create? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I, I sort of stumbled on um, user experience, um, usability, it was called back in the day, and design thinking through real life. So I was um, working at a, a different uh, interactive agency by this point, and we worked for a major auto manufacturer, and we were building some online tools for them to um, configure vehicles online. So like you pick your model and you pick your trim level and your color and all that stuff. And um, we had a, the front end for the consumers was, was very slick and worked really well. But we had this back end system we had to upload all the images and all the business rules around which package could go with which trim level and blah, blah, blah. And it was super complex and it was very difficult to use. And we were trying to teach our client how to use it, but it was just so complex that they couldn't. And I was up late at night, night after night after night, loading information into the system. And I just remember thinking like, there has got to be a better way <laughs> than somebody at one in the morning, you know, uploading pictures of wheels um, onto this system. And I just started trying to figure out, you know, how could we make things easier to use? I, I didn't even have the words yet. And that's when I stumbled on this field of usability. And ultimately, um, I'm not sure that it's the best method in, in life, but my way of learning something new um, is to go take a class in it or um, ultimately what happened is I went back to graduate school um, at Georgia Tech and um, got a degree in human computer interaction which is essentially if you could boil it down is people are good at certain things and computers are good at different things and if you can design a system where everybody does what they're actually good at um, then you have something that's that works well and makes people happy <laughs> so um, it was kind of a long journey um, to, to get there, um, to figure out what it even was the problem I was trying to solve. And then, you know, what were the right um, frameworks that I needed to, to learn and figure out, um, you know, to, to become proficient in that. Do you think, do you think obviously we're in the middle of a, a historic time in business, um, at least for all of us, you know, mm -hmm. that are alive today and that are working, do you think, there could be some really healthy implications for design thinking to all of us who are trying to figure out how to re-engineer um, our experiences, whatever they may be. Ours is the museum and heritage park experience, but everybody is trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what do we do in this new normal? So uh, yeah. speak a little bit about that. Well, I think, you know, the businesses that are, that are thriving right now are the ones that have been, that have been able to figure out how to pivot. Um, and you know, some of them, which seem like they're just absolutely doomed, um, some of them have figured out some really remarkable pivots and they've been able to um, pause and think about, okay, what do our end users, our end customers really need right now? And they've been able to take the essence of what it is they do well and figure out new delivery channels for that. You know, whether it's online or, I mean, the most basic example is restaurants figuring out 
okay, I can't have people in my dining room, but I can do takeout. I can do, you know, I can do all kinds of different things. And there's a, a friend of mine who runs a museum um, out West and they essentially spent a weekend just all hands on deck and transformed into an online virtual museum and, you know, came up with curriculum for homeschooling and came up with pathways through the museum that you could do, you know, over a course of several different days. And I mean, they just, they just said, okay, life as we know it is, is over for temporary. And how are we going to pivot to, you know, this whole different world and, and how can we be creative and how can we take the assets that we already have and just realize them in a new way. Um, and you, you sort of did that a little bit when you were trying to think uh, when you first started Core 10. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to hear a little bit about what Core 10 is, but then I also want to understand better, how did you decide there was so much opportunity in the rural communities versus going overseas or taking your business to New York? You know, tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to try to do this succinctly, but I have to take you back, back to college and, and say that I always had this innate sense that I love technology, but whatever I, I did in the technology field, I had to figure out what I could do that couldn't be sent overseas because that trend was already happening even back in the late nineties. And I always try to think, you know, what is it, you know, that I can do where being here in the U S lends me an advantage that just can't be, you know, overcome by somebody who can do it cheaper. So, you know, lucky for me, I think design um, was one of those things, um, but that just kind of was always in the back of my head. And, you know, being in a technology business, you sort of can't help but, um, but participate in projects where part of it's being offshore. And there's a lot of headaches. Um, you know, there's the 5 a.m. conference call because the folks in India are getting ready to go to bed or, you know, that sort of thing. Or there's, there's sending a spec out at the end of the day going to bed, waking up the next morning, getting it back and realizing, no way, this is not at all what I expected. And then having to wait 24 hours, you know, to, to fix it. Um, and so um, the first thing that I, that I did was think like, you know, we just have to do this work in the U.S. because we, we can't have the headaches and we need to have the cultural um, affinity. And we, you know, we, we need to, we need, people who are doing this technology work that really understand the U.S. consumer. But ultimately, you know, price can, can be a very powerful motivator. And people just continue to, to gravitate to doing things overseas, even with the headaches, it was kind of worth it for the, for the price. And um, part of the premise of Core 10 is that software development work can be done in the United States with high quality, but it doesn't have to cost a fortune. Um, and people, do, people think that development work is mainly done in these large metro areas like Silicon Valley and New York and Seattle. Um, but we believe that talent and uh, aptitude and capability is, is given out equally <laughs> across the whole country. Um, and that there are tons of smart and capable and hardworking people in areas that nobody ever thinks of for software development. And a really handy byproduct of that is that most of those places, the cost of living is much less than in um, Silicon Valley in New York. Um, and so you can, what we've done is figure out how to marry the positive economics of um, small towns and rural areas, the cost of living there, with the high quality, um, high education, um, smart people that are there and put that together and all of a sudden you've, you've solved this issue of um, being able to do something that's very high quality, but at a good value, um, and relatively speaking at a low cost. We certainly can never beat India or China in price, um, but we can, we can get to a point where the difference in quality is worth the difference in price. And you, uh, not too long ago, opened an office uh, about 20 minutes from us in Martin. Yes. Um, to, what, what, obviously, you could have gone anywhere when you yes. were trying to figure out where to go. What made you select Martin? Well, you know, I mentioned just a second ago, um, 
really strong, high levels, quality education. Um, that is UT Martin in a nutshell. And um, the computer science program at UT Martin is absolutely top notch. Um, it's, it's just quite incredible how well the graduates of that school um, come out of, of undergrad able to jump into a professional environment and deliver like almost day one. It's just uncanny. Um, and so we got to know UT Martin through some um, associates in Nashville and um, they were so welcoming and so interested in having us come see the town and see the school and meet some of the students and um, literally the first meeting was like the first of April and by the first of July we had four students hired in a temporary office in the student center. I mean it just happened like that. Um, but you know, it's kind of like when you fall in love and meet your, the one, like when you know, you know, and um, you know, it was just a great fit for us in Martin. Well, I'm, I'm personally really glad you guys are over there. Um, and I hear a lot of really good things and I agree with you having UT Martin so close um, as a person working in both the attractions and the museum business, having those UT Martin graduates able to come here and work and intern and, you know, it's really, you know, a big part of what we do here. So. Um, yeah. It's really um, exciting. Um, and there's, there's one other thing I'll, I'll say to you about our model um, at Corten, which we call Hearshore, H-E-R-E-S-H-O-R-E. -E. Um, and that is that we're finding that a lot of the people in these small towns and rural areas, they want to stay there. That's the, that's the real key. Um, and so they want the ability to have a, a good paying professional job with a career path in the place that they call home. And so I think that's just really important to note is that um, there's a decent you know, number of companies that are pulling people out of rural areas, um, but our goal is to have them thrive in their own home, you know, in, in the place that they care about and wanna live in. Like, it is possible to live where you grew up and make a great living and have a you know, strong career. And, and there are, um, you know, there are appealing aspects of living in a rural community. As somebody who moved here from Washington, D.C., you know, I can vouch for there are, there are, there's a long list of really good reasons um, why it's, it's uh, fun for your family and fun for you to, to be working and living around a small uh, community like this. Yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be that the only way you can have a satisfying career in technology is to go to a big city. Just it just right. shouldn't be like that. <laughs> so. Well, and one of the um, one of the benefits to me of living around here is there are a lot of uh, miles you can cover on your bicycle, and so yes. I, know, I know that's a big part of what you do. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, your your biking. Sure. Well, that's one of the reasons. So I live on the outskirts of Nashville, just about as far um, southwest as you can get um, and still kind of be considered Nashville and the reason that we live out here is because the cycling is just so amazing right out our back door um, so kind of like computers I've always loved to ride bikes that was the thing I did as a kid um, a lot just always loved it and um, met my husband he was a, a big cyclist and uh, I would go to, to bike races with him and I would watch the women race and I thought I could do that. <laughs> Famous last words. It's a lot harder than it looks. Um, but, um, you know, he, he got me started on, um, you know, riding again as an adult and I just took to it and loved it um, and started racing bikes. And, um, you know, the women's field is, is relatively small compared to the men's field um, in cycling. And so it's, it, you know, there's, there's room to grow quickly in the, in the sport if you want to spend the time and, and do the training. So I, I, you know, raced all over the Southeast. And then I spent, um, as, I've, as I've told some of my colleagues, one uh, extremely exciting and exhausting season um, racing all over the country, which was really fun, um, but, but solidified for me that cycling was not going to be my profession. <laughs> it's just a hobby. Um, but, but a wonderful way to meet new people and push myself to the physical limits and see gorgeous parts of the country that I never would have seen, um, and blow off steam and burn calories. <laughs> so it's all good. 
Yeah, I agree. And your husband, he he rides as well. So you guys must have like lots of great bikes hanging in your garage and tools and you know. Yeah, and- we have we have a yeah pretty cool little bike workshop out there. Um, we're actually you know since I don't race anymore, I used to have a, a road bike, a mountain bike, a time trial bike, a cyclocross bike. Um, and now I just have a road bike. Um, although I've got a mountain bike being built up because we have a, a five year old who, um, you know, just naturally watched us riding our bikes and he was on a strider bike, you know, before he turned two and he was riding, um, with pedals before he was three. Uh, he's never had training wheels. That's like my husband's claim to fame. <laughs> and so he is a tremendous little bike rider and, um, we've taken him out on the mountain bike trails and. I told my husband, you got to build me up a mountain bike. Like this is just too great uh, to miss. So um, we'll be hitting the trails as a family, you know, here in a week or so. You may be raising a little Olympian. (laughs) Well, I don't know about that. I think what it is, is, you know, when they're little, they're so low to the ground. He just has amazing bike handling skills because if he's going to fall, he just doesn't have very far to go. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us this morning. Um, it's fun being quarantined with you, um, hearing all about Core 10 and, and some of the things going on with you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be part of your show and um, can't wait to meet in person. Absolutely. This is Scott Williams, president of Discovery Park of America. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.